Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our loving, most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity for us to be here today. Lord God, it's a wonderful Sabbath day and time to come and worship you, to set things aside and to commune with you that we may build that relationship, that love that you have for us. We may learn how to love you back. Lord God, we ask you to be with us here today as we hear the words that you have given to me. Lord, I ask them not to be my words, but yours. If anything needs to be added or taken out, Lord, of this sermon, let it be of your choosing. Give us the Holy Spirit today, Lord, that we may continually walk with you, that we may change our old ways and learn the new things that we need to know. Lord God, thank you for all this, and I ask you to be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I was a parent, I really did not know what God had in store for me. My wife Kayla and I really wanted kids. We struggled to have them for a few years, but prayed that the Lord would bless us, and he did just that. As I had mentioned, we have two beautiful daughters, Adeline and Elise, and they are growing. They are often a handful, though, and uh, through this handful of joy, the Lord has taught me many things and has changed me in many ways that I never could have imagined. Until you have the opportunity to be a parent, you may never fully understand God and how he is a parent to us. And this has ultimately, I believe, made me someone more fit for heaven. Sometimes I'll sit down and reflect on some of the things that God has taught me through these two wonderful girls and the struggles that we have to deal with in life. And one of them I wanted to share with you today, we'll probably revisit this again and share more in the future, but one of the things I've noticed through my children is the resiliency that they have. No matter what they are doing, they will keep pushing through in various ways until they get what they want. Whether it is my youngest daughter, Elise, who's almost three, being able to recently learn how to walk through the many countless times of her falling down and many opportunities to stand back up. She would always rise back up and continue to try. She isn't quite steady on her feet yet, but she has learned now that it is the best way to get around, and so she persists to do so. Or my older daughter, Adeline, who is extremely persistent in just about everything. At this age, she is wanting the things that she shouldn't have whether it's the cookies that are on the counter or the toys that she has just stolen from her sister, she always is determined to get what she wants, whether it's through the screaming and kicking or the pleading with us with pleases and thank yous to get what she wants. And as I reflect on this, I see the character of God shining through them. As children, we can see the most genuine human being you can find. Though they're very selfish in nature, they're very innocent, right? And God tells us that's the kind of character he wants to see in us, an innocent character, one not defiled by sin. But also in this character of persistence, we see God as a persistent father to us. Our walk in life is very similar to that of children, and in this persisting as well as many other characteristics that they have. All around us, Satan goes trying to devour us every day, in whatever way he can, either spiritually or physically. But we must persist. And greater yet, God does the same. He persists with us. He gives us every opportunity and more to come and meet with him daily. He stands at our door and knocks waiting for us to answer. And I believe we, as Seventh-day Adventists, have a greater advantage than any others. As we have the truth in the Word of God, we know what Revelation is telling us. We know who the beasts are. We know what the end times are going to look like. We have the spirit of prophecy to guide us back to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. But like many before us, sometimes we shrug off the opportunities that God has to strengthen our relationship with him, though he still persists. 
When I think of all the times I decided to stay home from prayer meeting, or the times I was traveling and decided that I would sleep in instead of meeting a new church family member far off, or any of the other opportunities regularly throughout the week that God gave me just a moment to meet with Him, I sometimes cringe at the lack of my persistence. He's always out there trying to bring us closer to Him. As we look through the Bible, I see many characters who have the same struggle that I have and some of you may have as well. One of my favorite, one of my favorite books in the Bible, I study it frequently, I try to study it with many people, is the book of Daniel. I'd like you to turn there. We're going to be reading a couple verses through there, at least through the first four chapters, because there's a character in the first four chapters that I believe exemplifies many of our walks of life. He's a pagan king that God desired to save. He's one of my favorite Bible characters, and it's one of the most wonderful stories about salvation, because this pagan king thought himself to be a god, thought himself to be worshipped as a god. Daniel 1 starts off with Daniel and his friends being brought to Babylon as captives to become a part of the king's eunuchs, to become servants or advisors to him, however the king saw fit. In doing this, the king needed to remove all loyalties to previous homes or countries or people and instill in them a worship for him as king and God, the lone authority in their life. Part of this was in changing their names and diets, but Daniel and his friends understood this and were loyal to their God. They did not partake in the foods that were off, likely offered to idols, nor the drinks that would lead to intoxication or benumbing of their minds. They were pure, and we can see through this that God rewarded them as an example to King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel and his friends made a deal to test them for 10 days against the others, allowing them to eat as God ordained. And here is what the Bible says about that. This is found in Daniel verse, or chapter 1, verse 15. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate of the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away the portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Continues in verse 18. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king, and in all manners of, wis of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. This was just the start of many times that the true God would reveal himself to King Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, Daniel and his friends received a reward, but I believe that their reward was to eventually win the heart of King Nebuchadnezzar. This was just the start, and they had to develop this relationship with God and persevere through many trials that we're going to continue to see. In Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. It says in Daniel 2, verse 1, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. This is one of the most famous chapters studied, at least I believe in evangelistic series. So hopefully many of you know, I'm just going to breeze through it as well. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. The dream disturbed him so much that he needed to know what its interpretation meant to him. What was going to be in his future? So he brought all his magicians, his astrologers, soothsayers, and even more to try to understand this dream. However, Nebuchadnezzar could no longer remember the dream. 
It had left him. And therefore, all of the fakes that were worshiping Satan and his army could not make up a lie for the interpretation because they could not know what the dream was. So the king Nebuchadnezzar put a decree to remove all of them, destroy them and their families. And when Daniel found this out, he asked the king for some time. Daniel prayed to God that the dream and its interpretation would be given to him. And as he prayed, God would answer. He revealed Nebuchadnezzar's dream to Daniel, as well as the interpretation. And so Daniel shared that with King Nebuchadnezzar. Another lesson for Nebuchadnezzar, that he would not live forever. That he was not the superior ruler of this world. And though this was something that might be hard for Nebuchadnezzar to understand, he took it as a sign from God. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, it says, The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. It's one miracle to be able to interpret a dream, but it's another miracle to to recite somebody else's dream, and then the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar knew that this had to be the truth. However, his newfound understanding of God did not last. Because we continue reading in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar decided to forget God again. He surrounded himself with selfish people, people who did not know God, and therefore they would often drag him back to his roots of self-worship. They convinced him not to allow anyone to worship any other god but himself and to bow down to the statue. This statue of gold was likely to take a shot back at God and show him that he could rule forever. In Daniel chapter 2, we saw the multi-mineral statue where the head of gold was to represent Nebuchadnezzar. But then after, there would be silver and bronze and iron and iron mixed with clay, all representing that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom would fall. But ultimately, at the end, a rock would strike the statue, representing Christ and his true kingdom to come and live forever. Nebuchadnezzar did not want that to happen. He didn't want his people to know that he was not the God of gods. But there was another God, a revealer of dreams, who was better than him. And so he made a statue of all gold, saying that my kingdom will live forever. I don't care what you say. Now, God at any point could have just removed Nebuchadnezzar from the throne. Nebuchadnezzar was very stubborn, similar to others in the history of the Bible. Some would say he's even boneheaded and not likely the nicest man, as his commandments often ended in somebody dying. But God had bigger plans for Nebuchadnezzar. Now, when the trumpet sounded and all the music was played, everyone was to bow down before the statue, but there were three who did not. We know their names as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are their Babylonian names. Their their actual names are Hananiah, Meshach, and Azariah, as we saw in the first chapter of Daniel. They did not bow down to the statue, but they were given another chance. Maybe they didn't hear the sound. Maybe they didn't understand the command. They were given another chance, but with greater threats, and they still did not bow. I love the response that they say to Nebuchadnezzar as a witness of the true followers of God. Daniel 3, verse 16, it says, Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him... Oops, I'm in Daniel 4. Let me find Daniel 3. Bible chapters got stuck. There we go. (laughs) Daniel 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need to answer you in this manner. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, 
Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. This answer had to only have made Nebuchadnezzar more furious. And it says that he stoked the fire even hotter, so hot that the men who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into it fell dead just by standing outside. All while Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood unbound in the midst of the fire. It's explained in Daniel 3, verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Interesting for Nebuchadnezzar to know who the Son of God is. This really opened the heart of Nebuchadnezzar to the Lord even further. Though he had forgotten God, this was just another opportunity for God to reach out to him. It says in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's words, and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their house shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Now, though Nebuchadnezzar turned back to God again, seeing that he was the almighty God and that there was no other God as he is, he still had a little human nature holding him back. Because, as we saw in verse 29, he made a decree that anyone shall not speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or else they would be cut into pieces. Something that is not found in God's characteristic, but more of a human thing. Forcing other people to worship as you worship. Not allowing them to have the free choice to find the love of God on their own. Because Nebuchadnezzar was still holding on to his old self, God had one more lesson for him, or at least one more that is written in Daniel. And that's Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar has another dream and goes again for some reason to the old phonies who had lied to him so many times before. And this time he had, must have remembered the dream because he allowed them to tell him the interpretation of it, though he did not believe them. And when he found their interpretations to be false, he again remembered Daniel and called him up. Daniel told him the, the interpretation, though he was somewhat hesitant because Daniel knew what the interpretation meant. And he had become a friend of Nebuchadnezzar. He was his closest advisor. And he did not want Nebuchadnezzar to have to go through this pain and suffering to find God. But sometimes, in our stubborn natures, God has to let us walk away from him. To see, really, how much he protects and guides us. How much he loves us. And though we walk away, he is always close by. Ready to aid us at any time. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation that a mighty tree would grow and be the shelter for many, but the shelter would be cut down and the heart of it would be turned to that of an animal. He told Nebuchadnezzar that he was the tree and that he would be torn down from his kingdom. But again, at the end of it, if he would learn his lesson, God would return to him, and his kingdom would one day be his again. Daniel 4, 28 through 33 tells us how this all happens. 
All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Such simple words, but simple words that define the true heart that Nebuchadnezzar still had. A heart that still needed to be broken down a little further so that he could be saved. Verse 31 tells us, While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you out from men. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like an oxen. His body was wet with dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Nebuchadnezzar still had to grow a little more. Now, this circumstance that happened to him is unlikely to happen to us. But sometimes, when we place our trust in the material things that we have, those material things may not be as abundant to us. When we decide maybe to withhold the blessings that God has given us to ourselves instead of giving them for others, sometimes those blessings reduce until we learn and understand that this is just not for us. This is for others. However, the story again doesn't end here. This part is one of my favorite sections in the Bible. It is because it is written by Nebuchadnezzar himself, or at least spoken by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Verse 34 says, And at the end of time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles restored to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and the excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. What an amazing section. Coming from a pagan king, someone who thought himself to be God, God could save him. But it was with persistence that God needed to save him. God persistently pursued Nebuchadnezzar, but the most interesting thing is no matter how persistent God pursues somebody, they still always have a choice. And so Nebuchadnezzar chose to follow God. Now, I would not necessarily say that we here are like Nebuchadnezzar, because as I said in the beginning, I believe that we are different. We're here in this church because we have an understanding of something that other people might not understand. We have an increased knowledge that Nebuchadnezzar did not have. We already have a relationship with God. We commune with him daily. We have that opportunity to pray and know him. We have the truth. We know what the end is going to be. We understand the prophecies. So I believe there's another character or a group of them that we resemble a little bit more. And that is the disciples of Christ. The disciples were constantly in communication with Christ. 
They daily stood at the fountain of knowledge and could drink of the water of life at any given moment, but often were too lost in their own thoughts to do so. Some may disagree with me, but it is the only explanation as to why they could not understand Christ's mission until after it came to pass. On three separate occasions, Christ highlighted in the Gospels that he was to die. And there may even be many more opportunities that he discussed it with them that go unmentioned. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it discusses the exact same occurrences of Christ revealing that he must go and die, but the disciples did not understand or believe him. Matthew's first occurrence is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. If you want to read from your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew or be there for a little while. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. And it reads in verse 21, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. This is just the starting point of how Jesus would start to show them his true ministry. The disciples, ever since they met him, thought for sure he was going to set up a kingdom on earth, and they would rule with him. But it says in verse 21 that from this time, Jesus began to show his disciples. So as I said, we only have three recordings of it happening, but I believe he constantly was trying to show them the things that are going to come to pass. The second time is found in Matthew chapter 17. Just turn your Bible one page over and you should be there. We're starting in verse 22, Matthew 17, verse 22. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. You see, in the second time, they maybe started to understand something. Why is Jesus speaking this way? Is he not going to establish his kingdom here on earth? Maybe this is where Judas started to devise a plan and how to force him to do so. We see the third in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. It says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. After the first occurrence, Peter comes and tells Christ that this cannot be true. But Christ rebukes him and says, you are not listening to me. You are listening to the things of men. He even tells him to get behind me and refers to him as being influenced by Satan. The second time, the disciples became sorrowful Again, likely because they are hoping Christ to become their earthly Savior, that they may rule with Him. The Jews may be reestablished to the heights that they had in the stories of old. And the final time it gets mentioned, both Matthew and Mark agree immediately after the next section is talking about the greatness of serving. But that's Christ's greatness of serving. The disciples immediately after this, start bickering amongst one another, who will be the greatest in God's kingdom? In Matthew, it says that the mother of the Zebedee's sons came. And when the disciples heard that James and John had asked to be at his right and left, they began to be displeased with them and started fighting. 
about who is the greatest in the kingdom of God. They still did not understand what Jesus was about to do. Luke mentions it plainly after, immediately after it says that he will be raised on the third day in Luke, it says in chapter 18, verse 34, but they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Every day they spent with Christ, and they could not understand what was about to happen. They never fully grasped his message until after he had passed away. They all thought that he was going to rule an earthly kingdom. And Judas blindly acted on this feeling, thought he was superior to Christ's knowledge, and tried to push him to reveal his power. Now, in ignoring Christ's persistence, though only one truly made a grave mistake, and eleven eventually found the truth, They missed the many opportunities that they had or could have had so long ago. Imagine the, the increased amount of knowledge they could have gained had they understood what Christ had for them while he was still alive. They had the teacher right there. They could have asked him anything, but they were always focused on the things of this world. This is how I believe we as Seventh-day Adventists can be sometimes. Praise God, He is patient with us, but sometimes we have so many opportunities to see what God has for us, and we ignore them. Every week, there are church activities going on, whether it's prayer meeting or coming to church. Sometimes throughout the year, there's special programs like VBS or Vespers. There could be a cooking school like you just had, or an evangelistic series like you have now. All these are opportunities that God is presenting to us, that we may solidify our place with Him in heaven. It's an opportunity for Him to teach us as He ta taught Nebuchadnezzar. Is this the time that we could be enlightened prior to Christ's death, as the disciples were after? They were only enlightened after his death because of the upper room experience. But could we experience that while we're still communing with Christ daily? Or is this another time that will just pass us by and we will miss that opportunity to meet with Christ and learn what he has for us to know, to build that stronger relationship with him? Again, Nebuchadnezzar was given many opportunities and found the Lord, but others around him did not. And many of the disciples every day had opportunities, and though 11 of them founded him, one who spent three years alongside the Lord did not know him. Beyond this, God wants us to do something greater, and that is to save the souls of those around us. Sometimes when we decide to follow God, we set aside time for him, and others look at this as a good example and want to do the same. I often think of an old church member that some of you may know and others one day I believe will meet in heaven. It is actually two members, but the one mostly followed the other due to his loss of memory. Their names were Mary and Bob Dudley. No matter what was going on, these two people would be there. They attended every seminar. And when I say every seminar, Pastor Quillen put on five seminars a week sometimes. And though they had already attended it a year ago, they went to it again, sometimes the only ones there. If there was a prayer meeting, they would be there. And for many years while Pastor Garcia was here, because of things that he had going on or because he had to go to camp meeting or what it be, there was me, Mary, and Bob at prayer meeting. They were so dedicated to spending time with God that they would let nothing get in their way. Now, they didn't hold many church offices because of their age and inabilities, because of the illnesses that they had. They couldn't do that. But they were called to a different ministry, one that I call the ministry of attendance. 
They were there to support the church no matter what and ensure that they were learning the messages that they needed to be saved. Anytime I wonder why I need to go somewhere, I already know that it's because God wants me to be there. Just as anytime prior to their passing, when I would go to an event, Mary and du Bob Dudley would be there. They would be there like parents trying to support their children. Just as God persistently comes to us to support us in whatever we need. God continually gives us opportunities to serve Him, to build relationships with Him, to bring others to Christ. Right now, I know you guys have a series going on, and, and Saginaw is going to have one soon, too. And I hope that many of you can attend it. Even if you've gone to a hundred of them before, as I know some of us here are older than me, and they've probably attended one or two evangelistic series a year. You might know all the material, but there's always an opportunity to learn something new, to meet a new person, to see a new perspective, as I saw when I had my children. Even if sometimes it's a burden for us to set aside our time, God will give us that time back. Whether it's waking up a little bit early to find that devotional time, or turning off the TV when we get home so we can commune with God. Or even trying to set aside things that we want to do so we can attend events. God wants to commune with us so we can solidify our position in heaven. I have one last thought that always comes to mind when I think upon these things. And that is our scripture reading for today. If Daniel is one of my favorite books in the Bible, I sometime, or for some reason always come back to the book of John in chapter 14 when I do sermons. I don't know why. I'm just going to call it my favorite chapter. I think it can answer just about every question you have about God in John chapter 14. If you're stressed out, read John chapter 14. It can calm your nerves. If you need to know how to get to heaven, read John chapter 14. Because it tells us that he's the way, the truth, and the life. But maybe that's why I always reflect on John chapter 14 when I think about things like this. Because there's a disciple that when talking with Christ, he had a peculiar question. Philip said to him, this is John 14, verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. But Christ's answer really stabs me right in the heart sometimes. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Sometimes I think that I know it all. That I could read through the book of Daniel and I already know it all. Why should I do it again? I've already heard Pastor and John preach on this topic. Why should I listen to it again? But Christ's answer to Philip is the answer to me. Have I been so long with you, yet you do not know me? How long have we thought that we're communing with God, but sometimes only missing the obvious thing that he has in front of us? How many times has he knocked on our door to try to commune with us more so he can point out to the thing, the thing that we're missing? I just don't want us to miss out on those opportunities. So let us take every opportunity to commune with God. Whether, like I said, it's in our devotional lives. Whether it's doing Bible studies with others. Whether you want to write a sermon and use that time to learn and let God speak through you. Or even taking the time every week to go to church events of the many that are out there. 
and learn something new about God or just to show your support as God tries to support us. Whatever it is, I pray today that the answer, that you answer the Lord's knock and commune with him so that on the final day, you will not hear him say to you, have you not known me? But rather from Matthew 25, he will say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over only a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter in to the joy of thy Lord.